way, the Arab League will flatly refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state in the final resolution at the end of its two-day summit. The Malaysian government calls off all searches in the northern corridor for the missing plane while angry family members of missing passengers demonstrate in front of the Malaysian embassy in Beijing. And President Barack Obama says that the annexation of Crimea is not a done deal and that NATO will stand by its allies. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas announces in the Arab League summit in Kuwait that he will not agree to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. This comes as the clock on the peace process is ticking and Israel is questioning the next round of prisoners released due next week. More from I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev. The moment of truth is approaching. Two big questions are hovering above Jerusalem and Ramallah. Will Israeli-Palestinian peace talks be extended, and at what price? The deadline for the current round of negotiations is the end of April. But before that, another date is looming, next week's scheduled prison release. Israel has already released 78 of the 104 prisoners agreed upon as a goodwill gesture made by Jerusalem at the start of talks. But 26 remaining prisoners are waiting for next week. And here begins the mess. The Palestinians refuse to extend talks unless Israel takes certain measures, freezing West Bank settlement construction and going forward with the fourth and final prisoner release. Israelis, on the other hand, are unwilling to release the prisoners without a Palestinian commitment to extend talks. Confused? So is everyone else. Five days before the scheduled release, the issue is at the top of the agenda. Special American envoy Martin Indyk has been engaged in feverish talks to deal with this mess. But Abbas has already begun looking for an alternative to the American route and plans to appeal to leaders at the Kuwait summit of the Arab League to reaffirm the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative as an option instead of the framework formula being developed by Kerry. In the next days, we'll find out if Kerry can make or break the process. And joining me uh, right now, live from Ramallah, is Dr. Mudarar Kassis from the Birzet University. Good evening, Mr. Kassis. So uh, let me ask you, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas just said a short while ago the Palestinian Authority will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state. That means that the deadlock in the peace negotiation is just getting stronger. So why should Israel advance and release prisoners when there is no future? Well, as a matter of fact, this um, whole issue of recognizing Israel as this or that state, whether Jewish or, or, or elsewise, is um, the, the question of the Israeli citizens and not of the Palestinians or anybody else. Um, um, whether um, what, what Israel needs in terms of its legitimacy in the 21st century is to stop being a, an old uh, kind colonial regime. Um, um, that's, I think, where the issue lies, and that's where I think you know, all these diversions from the real question of ending the colonial situation um, that Israel is maintaining in, the, in, in Palestine and the, Palestine and the Palestinian territories uh, <coughs> is key to any future uh, definitions of uh, the type of the state of Israel and the type of the state of Palestine and the uh, kind of eventual relations between the two states and the question of um, um, Palestinians, um, uh, citizens of Israel, and, 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 and many other questions. The question of the um, uh, uh, Jewishness of Israel is not a, a question that can override, for example, the, the question of the right of return. And the idea of enforcing a predetermined recognition uh, uh, by the Palestinian uh, um, uh, politicians that they cannot claim the, um, uh, the, the, the legally established uh, right of return. Dr. Dr. Cassis uh, is uh, trying to hijack uh, the you know the rights of, of those individuals. Uh, what I'm yes? trying uh, what I'm trying to understand is like you're saying maybe this is not something for the Palestinian Authority to discuss and for the Palestinian citizens maybe this is a question for the Israeli citizens. But what I'm trying to understand here is if 
you know that the, uh, the Jewish, uh, let's say, um, uh, recognition of the Jewish state is a problem. If you know that you want to end the occupation, and we are hearing about the occupation a lot from the Palestinians, so if you want to end it and not play into the game and not play the game of Benjamin Netanyahu, maybe you should recognize the Jewish state and end it. But as a matter of fact, the, the whole question of the Jewishness of Israel is Netanyahu's game. And, uh, and the game that we really need to play is the game of peace. The, a, a very simple kind of uh, um, uh, act that should be taken. Uh, the Palestinians should practice their right to self-determination. Um, uh, only then can any other question really be, uh, be defined. Putting these conditions to delay the process or or creating a situation whereby your basic right to self-determination becomes bargainable and there is something that you have to do. Um, uh, uh, fr from my point of view, and excuse my language, uh, uh, amounts to prostitution. It's a, it's, it's a situation whereby you are forced, actually, to act mentally and verbally uh, against your will and against your wishes just because otherwise you will not be able to discuss your natural right to self-determination. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Cassis, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, conversation uh, with us. And uh, right now, uh, we're joining uh, from uh, Weizmann Institute, where the Israeli Prime Minister is marking Israeli Science Day with 25 Nobel Prize winners. His I-24 News diplomatic correspondent, Tal Shalev. Good evening, Tal. So what we can see until now, will the Israeli government release prisoners on the date that was agreed? Good evening, Lucy. Well, you know, the Israeli Prime Minister always prefers to talk about science and the Israeli mind and not about the peace process and prisoners, so I don't think we'll be getting an answer to this question tonight. But the common assumption is that if talks do break down, Netanyahu doesn't want Israel to be the one losing the blame game. So the common assumption is that Israel will move forward uh, with the prisoner release, even though inside the Israeli government there's a very strong internal pressure on Netanyahu not to move forward with the prisoner release if uh, Abbas doesn't commit to uh, continuing talks. And U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is expected to arrive just tomorrow in Amman to discuss this with Abbas, and maybe tomorrow we'll have a breakthrough. But Netanyahu himself hasn't addressed this issue directly in the past two weeks. He only said one thing to his Likud party members last week in a closed meeting. He told them that it's very important that if talks do break down, the world understands that Israel is not the one to blame and that the Palestinians are the one that rejected it. So, you know, uh, we've been through this process many times before. It's a very complicated process. It requires about 48 to 72 hours just to start initiating the prisoner release. So we'll probably get getting an, be getting an answer tomorrow or, or on Thursday if the uh, pr prisoner release will be going forward. Tal Shalev, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. And we're moving on. The Arab League summit opened today in Kuwait City under tension and diplomatic debate between many of the countries involved. Syria, who was dismissed from the summit, is still taking a crucial place there. I-24 News reporter Ori Shapira has more. Thousands of miles away from the G8 in The Hague, another significant conference is taking place. Kuwait opened the annual Arab League summit Tuesday with high tension and divisions between the participant countries. Our summit is taking place at a time when enormous dangers are taking place in the world and in our region for what it represents from an accumulation of challenges and dangers that we are confronting. The main topic of the session is the ongoing crisis in Syria that recently entered its fourth year. While Syria's membership in the league was suspended in 2011, Syrian opposition members are taking its place. But even within members of the opposition, there seems to be a little common ground regarding the future of Syria. Any election which Bashar al-Assad running for would be illegitimate. It is a game played in a country where there is a military conflict, where half of its residents are refugees or displaced. The Syrian delegation's empty seat sends a clear signal to al-Assad, who will translate this as kill and kill and your seat awaits you after you complete your war. This is the way the regime understands the message it is getting from the Arab world. Another center of controversy here is the Egyptian policy towards the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Over the last few weeks, Egypt increased its activities against the Brotherhood, including giving death sentences to 529 Brotherhood supporters. The differences between the countries escalated recently as Egypt, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia recalled their ambassadors from Qatar, who supports the Muslim Brotherhood. Members of the 22 Arab countries at the summit insist on presenting unity and collaboration, but underneath the surface the tempers are high in Kuwait City, and the summit has just begun. After yesterday's announcement that flight MH370 crashed into the Indian Ocean, efforts are now being made to locate any debris in the southern corridor, 2,500 kilometers southwest of Perth, Australia. Meanwhile, Chinese families members of the missing passengers are furious with the Malaysian government. More from I-24 News correspondent Oni Bambasat. The verdict on flight MH370 may be in, but where is the evidence? 18 days after the plane carrying 239 people went missing, the search has yet to bear any fruit. And the Malaysian government still has surprisingly little information to provide. There is evidence of a partial handshake between the aircraft and the ground station at 0019 UTC. At this time, this transmission is not understood and is subject to further ongoing work. The groundbreaking satellite information that led Malaysia to announce the plane crashed is still a mystery to investigators. But according to the country's transport minister, the data has narrowed the search area significantly and all operations in the northern corridor have been called off. All search efforts are now focused in the southern part of the southern corridor in an area covering some 469,407 square nautical miles. The search and rescue operation has now officially turned into a recovery and salvage mission, focusing all efforts on the extremely remote area between Australia and Antarctica. We're not searching for a needle in a haystack. We're still trying to define where the haystack is. On Tuesday, Australia suspended all search operations deploying from Perth due to extreme weather conditions. Six Chinese vessels are currently in the search area and are expected to arrive within the vicinity of the plane's last known position on Wednesday morning. Since the plane went missing, the Malaysian government has undergone harsh criticism over its crisis management and lack of transparency. Relatives of the missing passengers were left with no proof backing Monday's heartbreaking announcement. While China's foreign ministry asked Malaysia for the satellite evidence, angry family members demonstrated in front of the Malaysian embassy in Beijing and demanded to know the truth. There's no evidence. If you find something, OK, we accept, but nothing. Just from the data, just from an analysis, and you say that the, the flight is crap. But after almost three weeks, it is hard to believe there are any living survivors. And the only comfort that can now be offered to the families is information. But even answers are going to be hard to find in the vast, stormy waters of the Indian Ocean. The G7 nuclear summit talks in The Hague continue to be overshadowed by the Ukraine crisis as United States President Barack Obama expressed his concerns over Russia's takeover of the disputed territory. I-24 News correspondent Shahal Pellet has the story. Now that Ukrainian troops have left Crimea, the failed leadership is beginning to point blaming fingers. First to be dismissed is the country's acting defense minister, who was criticized for not pulling out Ukrainian servicemen faster from Crimea. Ihol Yuk, who was appointed only a month ago under the interim government, offered his resignation in a speech to parliament. I have never held on to my position and I am not going to hold on to it. That's why in this situation, if the administration has another view of the development of events and as other candidates, I have no objections. Meanwhile, during the meeting of world leaders in the International Nuclear Security Summit, American President Barack Obama continued to express his concern that Moscow will move deeper into Ukraine and warned Russian President Vladimir Putin that doing so will be a bad choice. Russia is a regional power that is threatening some of its immediate neighbors, not out of strength, but out of weakness. The fact that Russia felt compelled to go in militarily and lay bare uh, these violations of international law uh, indicates less influence, not more. But Moscow continues to shrug off Obama's drive to leave Putin in the cold. 
Russia's suspension from the G8 coalition and the cancellation of the summer summit Russia was to host in Sochi doesn't seem to bother the Soviet nation. If our Western partners believe the format has exhausted itself, we don't cling to this format. We don't believe it will be a big problem if it doesn't convene. As Putin deepens his control in the Black Sea Peninsula, the world will soon have to decide whether or not to increase the pressure on Russia and lead it out of its aggressive pose. Now let's take a look inside Israel. And now, joining me for a look inside Israel is I-24 News correspondent Eli Ochenberg. Good evening, Eli. Good evening, Lucy. And today, a mystery. While, why does the residents of some parts in central Israel cannot sleep before the wider investigation here in the studio? Let's see the report. Tel Aviv and Modin residents have black circles surrounding their eyes. The excessive noise caused by low-flying aircraft in the past few weeks is making it impossible for them to sleep. The opening of a second runway at the Ben Gurion airport at the beginning of the month led to changes in the flight path of incoming planes, which now circle over Tel Aviv at a 600 meter altitude instead of 1200 meters. In Modin, situated 300 meters above sea level, the noise is even louder. It creates massive noise all around, and it completely disrupts our daily life. It creates panic among children and the elderly. It's waking us up in the middle of the night. You cannot concentrate and work at home. This noise really messed up our life in the last month. This new reality has driven the residents to launch a petition on Facebook with already over 1,000 supporters. And following the wave of complaints, the issue reached the Parliament's Interior and Environment Protection Committee. But it's not a completely new saga. The runway, intended for landings, reopened after a three-and-a-half-year renovation, during which the airport had only one runway for takeoffs and landings. Thus, some say the complaints are a bit over the top. This route was closed over for three years. So the residents of Tel Aviv or southern Tel Aviv, who suffered until three years ago, suddenly got used to the good situation and are saying, what's that noise? We are not used to it. The Israel airport's authority responded, runway 1230 is Ben Gurion airport's main landing runway. The flight route to this runway passes over Modin at the same altitude as before the renovation. The airport authority operates a noise monitoring apparatus in coordination with the Environmental Protection Ministry to preserve the permitted noise levels. I have to say, Eli, there's not enough noise in Tel Aviv. Yeah, it's a very peaceful yeah. city, and we needed this uh, background Extra. noise. Yeah, but it's not a clear-cut situation. On the one hand, we have the residents that simply cannot hold a normal life routine because of the very low height of the flight. The sound is unbearable, not something you can ignore. Maybe the Ben Gurion airport can operate like other Western airports and not operate flights or takeoffs during nighttime. But on the other hand, it's not a surprise. This exact same route was completely active three years ago. So maybe, just maybe, the residents got a bit spoiled. One way or another, this uh, issue is now discussed in the parliament. So let's see what Israelis had to say about that. Let's see. Of course I hear planes, nighttime, daytime, all the time. Frankly, it's impossible to sleep. It did seem to be that uh, there's more planes recently. I didn't really... Uh, um, know that there was a new route, but it's nice to know that people are trying to make a difference. Every morning a plane wakes me up at about 6 o'clock. It goes right over my home. I'm trying to go to sleep and another one goes by. The noise is really awful. To tell the truth, I really didn't pay attention. I heard about it, but it really doesn't bother me. I didn't hear that one, honestly. No, the answer is, I don't hear it. Did you call me spoiled? <laughs> no, but let me put my money on the fact that this solution will come just in a long time for now. Okay. I will forgive you for now. <laughs> Eli Ochenberg, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. We're going out for a small break, two minutes break, and then we will be back for the daily question. Don't go anywhere. The news today, two minutes, and we will be back.
In Kuwait, the Arab League will flatly refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state in the final resolution at the end of its two-day summit. The Malaysian government calls off all searches in the northern corridor for the missing plane, while angry family members of missing passengers demonstrate in front of the Malaysian embassy in Beijing. President Barack Obama says that the annexation of Crimea is not a done deal and that NATO will stand by its allies. As we've reported this evening, families of the lost passengers of the Malaysian Airlines flight are in uproar and clashing with police since Malaysian officials announced the plane is likely in southern Indian Ocean. But no debris has been recovered and China is demanding concrete evidence. Today on The Daily Question, we asked, do you think the Malaysian government is hiding information on flight 370? Joining me is right now is I-24 News Editor Nuri Dunger. Good, Good evening. evening. So I believe that our uh, viewers think that maybe they did. Yeah, I, you're right. Let's go straight to the poll. 76% yes. said yes, we believe the Malaysian government is hiding information. Only 15% said no. And as you know, and as we just heard in Rony Ben Bassat's report, there has been an enormous wave of criticism since this flight disappeared on March 8th, including online criticism with hashtags, uh, I don't believe it, and so on. So online also, it's been a big deal. Definitely. Likewise, we heard it here. Let's go right away to those who said, uh, yes, they're hiding information and we don't trust the Malaysian government. Anton in the Bronx in the U.S. said, I don't understand how there was this big press conference saying it's in the Indian Ocean, but where are the real answers? Something is fishy here. He's echoed also by Etienne, who says the Malaysian authorities are hiding the truth since they confirmed the crash, but they don't even say why the plane changed direction. So let's see the numbers again, what yeah. our uh, viewers mm -hmm. think. 76% think that, it, yes, somebody is uh, hiding something, and 15% think And the frustrating no. thing that we hear in, in, in the answers also is that you have this overwhelming sense that they are hiding something, but so many different theories and this kind of sense that something's being hidden, but nobody knows what. Uh, so as they brought up, you know, you have uh, this plane changing direction. Nobody knows why. They haven't explained. There's no wreckage. There's no debris. No wreckage, nor n no bodies, nothing. It's yeah. it's actually still a mystery, I have to say. And it is weird that Very much just so. somebody just declares after 15 days that that's it. Yeah. Let's see uh, more uh, more comments. Let's go to Jacob in Cape Town. who says, Malaysia has managed this crisis poorly since day one with inconclusive information and contradicting facts every day. He echoes this, but uh, some of the, the things happening there in the press conferences, first they, they came out saying that the pilot, the co-pilot, said good night, the last kind of communication before the transponder was shut off. Then it was after, then it was we don't know. So there are a lot of kind of conflicting bits of information that may well be true. They, they may not know, but there's no doubt that it's giving people, and especially the families, this very strong sense that... Yeah, I think that if someone will know. try to put himself in the situation, this is not something very easy to cope with, uh, this situation, and just not to see any evidence, nothing on Imagine the surface. saying goodbye. I mean, there's always this issue of saying goodbye to a loved one when you don't have the, the physical, the body, which here in Israel, as you know, is kind of a big, yes. is a particularly big deal. Here, they don't even have the wreckage of the plane, never mind the body. So, yeah, uh, just somebody just came and told them it disappeared. One more uh, comment? Uh, let's go to Claude, who actually brings up a kind of different point that I'd be interested to hear uh, our analysts talk about. He wrote to us from China and said, we are not told everything, almost nothing. It's high time that uh, they allow passengers to use their cell phones during flights. With that, we would have had the clarity in real time with a tweet or a call. Now, how this affects aeronautics, I don't want to comment on, but there is a point that now we have real life updates from everything, from trials and so on. Yeah, let's, Imagine. Hear, uh, yeah, let's hear our expert, Aaron Lapidot, uh, aviation expert. Good evening, uh, Aaron. Good evening. So uh, let's try to understand. You're hearing our viewers, people seem most disrupted by the fact that they announced the plane is in the, in the ocean without any physical evidence. Is it fear? Well, uh, I can tell you this. It's uh, quite understandable why the people that are told that their loved ones are dead and there is no shred of physical evidence are acting uh, very angry, very confused, very... Uh, uh, they, they are not very happy with this, uh, with this possibility. So it's, it's, I'm not sure that it's a question of fear, but uh, it's more like, you know, it's, it's quite a normal reaction 
to uh, to uh, um, a declaration which is not based on physical uh, evidence. The, the, I, I, it's quite I, wanna, I, I want I want to understand something. Let's try to uh, you know touch wood. Try to ima imagine that something like that happens in the United States. Really, the United States can come and say, "Okay, the plane disappeared. That's it. Accept it." Well, uh, I can tell you this. There was uh, one of your viewers, a guy named Jacob, I think, from Cape Town, that said that uh, the Malaysian uh, government handled the whole affair very, very poorly, which is absolutely true. They acted quite, quite uh, improper, uh, as, uh, they, and they were very, very uh, um, not, they didn't do it according to what they should have done. In the United States, this wouldn't happen. They probably let the uh, investigators uh, comment on whatever uh, findings they have or what their speculations are, and not uh, immediately give the politician the uh, the stage. At, you know uh, what they were giving all sorts of declaration which are have no basis at all. And every yes. speculation that came up, they, they echoed that uh, speculation, yes. and uh, the next day they uh, contradicted it. So uh, uh, you know they acted very yes. bizarre. Yes, uh, of course, very bizarre. Aaron Lapidota, thank you very much for this. Very bizarre, but some people are ex some actually are, are have a little this. bit of mercy for the Malaysian government, but yes. I have to say not very much. They, uh, as we saw in the poll, aren't highly represented. Some of them did kind of reflect, though, what Mr. Lapidot just said. Let's jump to Komina, who wrote to us from Togo, mm -hmm. who says it's true that nothing is known on the cause of the disappearance, but it must be understood that a country such as Malaysia does not have the necessary means to go beyond. It takes the U.S., France, United Kingdom, China, and and so on. So. He uh, does kind of um, excuse them in the fact that perhaps it's a smaller country and they don't have the resources, but on the other hand, we have a lot of countries involved in the search, and when something of this magnitude happens, hard yes. to imagine that just that you cannot you know, give the excuse is, by we're a small country, yeah. we don't have enough efforts. Uh, Certainly not to the families. Let's just end with Jay Martin, who says this is not Malaysia's fault. It's safe to assume no government of a small country would have dealt with this any better, but I do have to say the, uh, the passengers' families are now given caregivers and five thousand dollars per passenger with, so uh, Zangar, thank you very much uh, for this of course you will be here tomorrow I with will. another question okay. we're going out for a small break two minutes break and then we you will see what is the connection between shakespeare and syria stay tuned the news today Kuwait, the Arab League will flatly refuse to recognize Israel as a Jewish state in the final resolution at the end of its two-day summit. The Malaysian government calls off all searches in the northern corridor for the missing plane, while angry family members of missing passengers demonstrate in front of the Malaysian embassy in Beijing. And President Barack Obama says that the annexation of Crimea is not a done deal and that NATO will stand by its allies. And uh, we're moving. Perhaps an end to a long-running issue between Israel and Turkey. Ankara's deputy prime minister today said that a final compensation deal with Israel on the Mavi Marmara incident could be closed. Arnik said a document uh, on a final agreement has been received from Israel and would likely be signed after Turkey's elections next week. The nine Turks were killed in a confrontation with Israeli soldiers on the ship in May of 2010 as it headed to Gaza in international waters. And with me now via Skype is Alon Liel, former Israeli ambassador to Turkey. Good evening. Good evening. So Alon, why was the announcement released specially now? It's not the first announcement of this kind and uh, uh, several senior uh, Turkish politicians, including this one, uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, made such statements uh, in the last few months, and uh, it was overruled by uh, 
the Prime Minister, by Erdogan. Uh, so I do not uh, attach too much importance to it, especially at this stage. We are six days before the municipal elections, but uh, these are elections that will determine the, the fate of Erdogan. And I think it's pointless to make statements so close to the elections. I think only after the elections we know what the decision will be. Is uh, maybe we can say that Erdogan looking for a closer relationship with Israel right now? I didn't get the question fully. If Erdogan wants, if can you repeat the question, please? I'm saying, is Erdogan looking for a closer relationship with Israel right now? No, I think Erdogan is busy this week only with one thing: the elections inside Turkey. The, these are so critical elections for him, and it can go either way. So I don't think he is really having his mind on any issue on foreign affairs. We know his basic position. He would like to see meaningful progress uh, between us and the Palestinians. He would like to see the removal of the siege on Gaza. But I don't think these are normal times for him. I think yes. after the elections, he will come back to the issue and he, and only he, will make the decision if he sends an ambassador to Israel. Yes, Salon Liel, uh, thank you very much for this. A day after an Egyptian court ordered a mass death sentence for 529 alleged supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi, nearly 700 more are in court. Mohamed Badia, the Muslim Brotherhood Supreme Guide, is one of those on trial. The UN today called the sen sentencing a breach of international human rights law. And Israeli energy and water minister Sylvain Shalom was questioned today by police for two hours over claims of sexual harassment that allegedly occurred 15 years ago. A statement by Israel police said that the decision to question Shalom was made in accordance with Attorney General Yuda Weinstein. Sylvain Shalom's spokesperson questioned the timing of the claims, giving that the minister was set to officially announce his candidacy for Israel's presidency. And just this hour, Israeli media is reporting that the case will likely be closed. Fifteen years, yes. Moving to the United States, the discovery of six more bodies in Washington state overnight brought the total number of deaths up to double digits and counting as the White House declares a state of disaster, fearing up federal resources. Of course, I-24 News desk reporters Mirav Savir and Ron Friedman filed their following report. The death toll from a massive mudslide in Washington state rose to 14 after six more bodies were found overnight. More than 170 people are still reported missing two days after a rain-soaked hillside near Oslo collapsed on their homes. Though search efforts continued using specially brought in hovercrafts, emergency management officials sounded pessimistic that anyone else would be extracted alive from the mud. We're still in a rescue mode at this time. However, I want to let everyone know that the, the situation is, is very grim. More than 45 inhabited properties were hit by the cascading mud burying some places in up to 15 feet of boulders and rubble. This is for a rescue, so we're looking for live victims. We're not spending a whole lot of time. It has to be quick and, and, and uh, thorough, but we're trying to move through and make sure there's nobody in those areas. Authorities maintain hope that many of those reported as missing would turn out to be survivors who were either double counted or slow in alerting others about their whereabouts. Still, uh, United States uh, President Barack Obama is proposing to end the National Security Agency's practice of collecting phone records in bulk. According to the New York Times, the Obama administration will propose legislation to end the program. If Congress approves it, the NSA would need a court order to collect specific records on Americans. Obama promised NSA reform earlier this year amidst outrage over its practices. And let's look a little bit on economy. And joining me uh, right now is Dr. Alice Komen from the Academic College of Tel Aviv uh, University. Good evening. Thank Good evening. you very much for coming. Yeah. And we're discussing today a little bit about uh, uh, sanctions against Russia. Um, you know, 
we're looking at this uh, from one side, you know, there are sanctions from the other side. There is, uh, sorry, Russia is giving as uh, giving gas, uh, uh, yeah. providing gas to Europe. How does it work? Well, first, the first question is, since there's a nice war between Russia and the Ukraine, the question is, how can you make money out of it? That's basically what economists ask themselves. So how do you profit from, from that? Well, exactly. Russia is basically is very aggressive in the sense that Gazprom, the, the Russian company, is not just a company selling gas. It is actually a very big stick that Russia is waving against any country who wants to, uh, um, to n not to respect its, its power in Europe. And it basically says, tells countries across Europe, if you want to freeze in the winter, it's okay with us. We will not uh, deliver gas. So for this reason, I think the sanctions are going to be very, very uh, fuzzy Boy, and not yes. very efficient. So now, if we want to invest in, uh, like, let's say, the stock market in uh, Russia, should we or should we not? Well, okay, it's, 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 <laughs> it's a little it's bit a complicated. Exactly, 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 okay. exactly. So why is it complicated? On one hand, there's a big opportunity because we can see the, the, the Russian, in general, since January, uh, the Russian stock market has been uh, massively depressed. And if I want to talk about three hypothetical uh, opportunities, one would be just an index. There's the market vectors Russia, which is just an index of leading Russian stocks. It went down 22% since January. And you might say that since you do not expect Russia to be that hurt, that could be an opportunity, assuming that it will bounce. Another example is Yandex, which is the Russian Google. It's been down 35%. It's difficult to understand why you would expect the Russian Google uh, to, to lose value or to generate less. On the contrary, I would think that uh, another company is CTC Media, which lost 40%. Now, normally you think that when there's tension and war, people watch more television, they're more advertising. So, so you might say these would be good invent, uh, investments. Uh, however, I'm quite suspicious about Russian stock market because, uh, because people saw a big opportunity in the growth of Russia and yeah. and. But many companies that are very, very massively manipulated. I mentioned Gazprom. Normally, you'd say Gazprom is like British, uh, uh, British Gas or, or things like companies like that. But it's not. It's actually a, 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 a tool of the government. So it's very difficult to predict what will happen. So in this case, the let's say the threatening of the political uh, right now arena of Vladimir Putin got nothing to do with the economy. Well, right now, well. It, it had Again, it's a little it, bit in the tricky. past. <laughs> no, but yeah, exactly. But I, in a sense, some people say there's going to be tension, so Russian stocks are going to crash, so short them. I do not think this way. On the contrary, I do not think that Russian stocks are going to crash. So I would, I would invest. Normally, I would invest in these points, either the index or some other stocks. But I'm concerned because it's not an efficient market. It's not a market where people buy and sell. There's too much bear pause involved in these markets. So you're telling me basically keep your money in your pocket for now. Yes. Don't invest it in Russia at least. Spend it. Spend it. Oh, thank you very much for this. The World Health Organization says pollution contributed approximately 7 million deaths worldwide in 2012. Causes range from auto fumes to cooking fires. Pollution was related to one out of eight deaths, including killers such as heart diseases, uh, lung cancer and strokes. The hardest hit regions are Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, including pollution plagued China. And joining me all right now via Skype is Neta Akhitouv, an environmental reporter for Haaretz Daily Newspaper. Good evening. Good evening. So, Neta, we have to say that these numbers seem, they are shocking. Yes, they are shocking. Uh, it's uh, actually, the numbers have risen since the last time it's been checked. And they think that the rise in the numbers is due for two reasons. First, because there is more pollution, so there is more, there are more casualties. And second, because the data is more accurate lately, and you can measure it more better than once than we used to measure it before. So there is a real rise in the numbers, but there are also, you know, not a real one. Just a um, the way they check it is better. So, so Neta, we just saw what happened in Paris to just uh, a week uh, ago. Yeah. How bad is the situation of the world pollution, uh, let's say worldwide? 
It's very bad, and Paris is in a, it's a, an exclusion because most of the pollution is in poor countries, in developing world, in Asia. It's the worst place to be, uh, and mostly for poor communities, uh, women and children. And what's interesting in this um, in the report is that half of the deaths are because of indoors pollution. It's not just outdoors from companies, factories, and cars. It's also indoors pollution from um, from house use of coal, wood, and other means of cooking and heating the house that are not very efficient and that they they're very polluting and very dangerous for your health. Yeah, unfortunately, always the poor people oh. are suffering. Uh, Natachi Tuf, thank you very much for this. Thank you. And scientists met uh, over one uh, with over 100 government's representatives today in the Japanese port city of Yokohama on climate change. The goal is to finalize wording of a UN report on how to deal with climate change. The meeting looks at how climate change will disrupt food supplies and hurt economic growth and looks to finding ways to adapt to rising temperatures, floods and unpredictable weather. 400 years after Shakespeare wrote his tragic masterpiece King Lear, children in a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan are staging the play in an attempt to forget the horrors back home, at least for a while. I-24 News cultural correspondent Shahal Pelad takes a look. It's probably the last place you'd imagine to find a Shakespeare play rehearsal, in a refugee camp in the middle of the desert. But under a huge white tent in the desert dust of Jordan, a hundred Syrian refugee children at Zaatri refugee camp are rehearsing King Lear, one of Shakespeare's great tragedies. Their mentor, Syrian actor turned director Nawar Babal, who has worked with them for more than two months, hopes to draw attention to their plight. He seeks to revive their childhood. He himself starred in several hit soap operas at home before falling foul of President Bashar al-Assad's regime and fleeing into exile. High Shakespearean theatre is not commonly associated with refugee camps, yet a similar attempt took place eight years ago in the Jenin refugee camp in the West Bank, when actor Giuliano Mel established the Freedom Theatre, trying to provide opportunities for children, but also a political statement. It was a very critical theatre, and a theatre that was very critical of everything and of everybody. He initially went back to Jenin, because he wanted to struggle with his friends against the, the occupation. Mer, who became famous in Israel for his controversial portrayal of Shakespeare's Othello, was assassinated, presumably by Palestinian extremists who objected to his artistic and theatrical work with the children. It's hard, I mean, if you fight through uh, culture and art, and through your words and images, you can't fight a gun, unfortunately. But the ill-fated story of the Jenin refugee camp theater doesn't seem to be stopping new attempts. Jordan currently holds more than 500,000 Syrian refugees, including 100,000 in Za'atri, more than half of them children. Uttering the words of the world's greatest playwright, in classical Arabic, of course, is a beacon of light for some of the kids. The tragic story of the monarch has been adapted and modified to make it more suitable for children who have become jaded by the death and destruction they have seen. For them, performing Shakespeare's play in the heart of the refugee camp is a welcome break from the real-life tragedy around them. Of course, now we will look at culture. And uh, to look more at culture, joining me on set is host of I-24 News Culture Magazine, Oded Golba. Good Hi, evening. Lucy. So a lot of concerts are going to be happening here in right Tel Aviv. Here. Yeah, if yes. you're a music lover and you intend to, to spend the summer Definitely. in Israel, yeah. I know you're both. <laughs> There's a lot to look forward to. Uh, yesterday, history was made when in a press conference it was announced that the Rolling Stones, I don't know if you heard of the band. You think that I didn't uh, hear? Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, a group of uh, young up-and-comers. Uh, uh, up <laughs> uh, uh, they will um, uh, perform in Israel on June 4th at uh, Hayalkon Park. You know, they've had a 
unbelievable career. More than 50 years they've been around now. But there is a lot of criticism here, here in Israel about the prices of the tickets. Yes. Um, a little bit expensive, a, I have. It is a little bit expensive. The, the cheapest ticket uh, will be around 150 uh, US, uh, which is uh, uh, a nice chunk of change, no, yes. no question about it. But Rolling Stones, you know, 50 years behind them, um, you know, uh, 29 studio albums, 19 concert records, and uh, many, many collections and um, they've been offered um, there's no official uh, figure but mm, rumors are around uh, 4.5 million dollars for their performance so somebody has to pay that you know that so will be us unfortunately and, uh, uh, yes of course <laughs> well, you know, friend, of course we will be if you're that. looking for something uh, lighter. maybe lighter um, Justin Timberlake is uh, is coming this is a show that I want to see I have to I'm see. sure it's gonna be an a great show. It's gonna be, you know, he, he started his his tour. He's on a world tour, unbelievable. He's all over the place. He started five months ago. So far, pretty much all of his shows were sold out so, uh, all across when it's going uh, to the happen U.S. In Israel, in Israel he'll be uh, at May 28th. May 28th. Save okay. the date. I'm saving also the date. Also at uh, I'm not Korn working Park. at that date. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll let them know. Uh, also worth noting, okay. Soundgarden and the Pixies will uh, come and take part in um, the Rock and, rock and Roller the Festival. Yeah, a little bit back to the 90s, but it's still good fun. Uh, June uh, 17th, 8th and uh, 18th at uh, Bloomfield uh, Stadium will be the first time for both uh, um, bands to, to arrive in, in Israel. The Pixies had to cancel their um, last performance. Do you have any discount on the ticket <laughs> so I can? Uh, I'll see what we. Can. I'll see what I can uh, just set uh, you up with. Yeah, set me up. Okay, <laughs> Global. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure yes. thing. Malot um, Tarshicha, a small uh, soccer team from a lower league in Israel, is hoping to make a sensation today, having reached the quarterfinals of the Israel League Cup. I24 News reporter Uli Shapira looks at the story of the mixed Muslim Christian Jewish team and its attempt to overcome the obstacles all the way to the finals. Malot Tarshicha, only a few kilometers from the Lebanese border, may be the perfect example of how Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together. Its history goes back to the era of the Crusades, but today the local soccer club can make history of its own. Last week, the underdog club from the Israeli's fourth league made the impossible possible by reaching the quarterfinal of the Israeli Cup, leaving the favorite teams from Tel Aviv and Haifa behind. We want to win this game and to move forward to the semifinals. It's not easy. We are playing against the more senior team. When we played against other teams from higher leagues, nobody gave us a chance and we beat them. So now we are full of motivation and we really believe we can move to the next level. In the daily life, they may have different views, but here on the field, they all share the same goal, to win the game. We are like brothers in the team. I don't think you can find such a brotherhood and solidarity among Jews and Arabs in any other team. Over the years, the city has made it to the headlines mainly after unfortunate circumstances, such as missile and terror attacks. In 1974, Fatah terrorists kidnapped and killed 25 residents of the town. In 2006, during the Second Lebanon War, the city was hit by hundreds of missiles launched by the Hezbollah terror group. After years of being divided in the news, the people of Malot Tarshicha hope to be united in raising the winning cup in the air. And all of you. Now we are going to do some sports. Just kidding. Ah, it's a sports, of you course. Are? Host of I24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Regan. Good, Good evening, evening. Rusty. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. So, the game, Malot El Shicha. Let's put it this way, we will not do a report ahead of the semifinal. They lost. They lost. I will not disclose the result, but they lost, 8-0. <laughs> 8-0? 8-0, but... What, was it a basketball game? Look, they're, they're a team from the fourth division. They were facing a team from the first division. They weren't even supposed to be to be in the stage, and they were. They beat uh, teams from, from higher higher levels, higher leagues, 
coming into this game and the fact that they did make it to the final eight is very very happy very emotional we just saw in that we just saw in the in the film it's it's always happy when we call it cinderellas in sport when they make it to these high stages especially when it is malo tarshicha with all the stories uh, regarding this, this you know this i'm village. going to say something that except our uh, maybe editor mm -hmm. i don't want to sound not patriot but i don't see israeli football no comment on my behalf no it's, it's not no comments. <laughs> it's not good. It's, it's, it's not by yes. chance that we haven't made it to the World Cup in 44 years. But uh, the stories is good. And, and, and the cups, the local cups, are the ch is, a good is, story. Is, the ch is the chance for, for, for teams for, from lower leagues to excel. The current Israeli uh, um, cup holder, actually, is a Paul Ramat Gan, a team that was relegated last season to the second division. Same story in England. Wigan won the FA Cup. They were relegated to, to the second division. So local cups are always the, the, the place for, low, for lower teams to excel. It's not the big teams in Israel, Maccabi Tel Aviv, Apoel Tel Aviv, that are going to win it. Talk, Someone else. Let's talk about big teams. Very big teams. Yes. Bayern Munich. We've mentioned Real that football. name a couple of times uh, yes. in the studio. They can win the championship tonight. They have a game in Berlin against Hertha Berlin, about to start in five or six minutes. If they win, they will win the championship. Seven games left till the end of the season. Two months left. No one ever won the, the, the Bundesliga in March. It doesn't happen. The season ends in May. Wow. If they win in Berlin tonight, they will win it. There's a chance they win it even, even if they... So they are going to play die. for fun? They're going to keep, keep their legs for Champions League, let's put it this way. <laughs> But but Bayern Munich is, has been breaking so far every possible record, and they're very. And you very have good. an incredible goal for us. Goal from half court, half half line, whatever they call it in Australia. Take a look. His wow. And it's in. Wow. 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 Very nice. By very the way, nice. the team the, the team lost to one, but but <laughs> but they did. But, you know, they should get half a point for the most beautiful goal scored in the game. Come on, why do you ruin the party? I am. I am a newsman. I have to bring proper facts. They lost and they scored a beautiful goal. It's a true story. True story. Jonathan Regev, thank you very much for thank this. Thank you, Lucy. You're ruining the party. Yes, party But at least party. Israel has good football. Not. Yeah. Yes. Jonathan <laughs> Regev, thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. We're going out for a small break and then we will be back for the daily debate. Don't go anywhere in the news today. We will be back. Four minutes break and then I'm back.